Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed the breakout sessions and uh, made some connections. So, to close out our final session, um, you know, I wanted to take a little step back and, and talk about the brain in a way that we haven't done so. You know, we spent a day and a half talking about some very serious things, how tumors affect the brain, how we can work on you know, helping the brain and helping us ourselves deal with the effects of brain tumors. But for this session, I really want us to take a step back and look at this extraordinary organ that brings us all together. The researchers and the clinicians that you heard are all in this field because they're amazed by the brain and how the brain works and what it can do. And there's not enough that we know about it and we're continuing to learn more about it. Uh, but I think um, the more we learn about it, the better we will be at fighting brain tumors in the future. But we do know that the brain functions through interconnection of neural networks that uh, transfers information and allows us to do what we want to do and more importantly, be who we are. And that's why, why we do what we do as clinicians, is allow you to do what you want to do and be who you are. And so this session, we will discuss how the connections in our brains develop, evolve, and work together to make us who we are. Speaking today on brain connection will be Dr. Benjamin Demine. He is a professor at the Baylor College of Medicine in the Department of Neurosurgery, Center for Cell and Gene Therapy, and Center for Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine. He's also the director of the Center for Cancer Neuroscience. Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine, and I work very closely with neurosurgeons and neuro oncologists. And the goal of my lab is to study how brain function can be used to understand brain tumors and eventually treat brain tumors. So I will acknowledge that I have no conflicts and I have nothing to disclose. I think that's an important part of all of this. So the brain is unique, as was mentioned previously. Um, the brain is the essence of your identity. And when you have something growing, apparently, in your brain, that's going to affect your identity, it could even steal your identity in some cases. In addition to your identity yourself, it also is important, brain tumors also cause brain dysfunction. A lot of neurological conditions like epilepsy, motor defects, and so forth, right? So when you have an aberrant growth in the brain, it's going to cause all of these effects that you don't see from other tumors. Moreover, the brain is the most sensitive and important organ in your body. So when you have a blood cancer, you can remove the blood, put in new blood. If you have a prostate tumor or a breast tumor, you can remove the diseased tissue and you're okay. For the brain, you cannot remove the brain and you cannot regrow the brain, right? So this makes it very, very challenging. In addition to the complexity of the organ itself, which we don't even fully understand how it works. So, in that context, in that backdrop, I'm gonna give you guys a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. First, I will give you guys a crash course, a true crash course in how the brain functions. The second part will be emphasizing cancer neuroscience, where brain function meets brain tumors. And in the final five or 10 minutes or so, I will talk about how we can use, hopefully use neuroscience as a tool in the future to combat brain tumors. So with that said, let me begin. So neuroscience for non-neuroscientists. I know that a lot of neuroscientists like to make the brain out to be very complex and complicated, and it is. But there are a few basic rules that we can understand that will help us, under, help us give us a greater insight into how the brain functions and hopefully into how brain tumors operate. So I don't even tell you guys this, but the brain controls all aspects of our condition. And the way that I like to think about it is you have an experience of some sort, right? You process that experience in your brain. That experience gets basically volleyed around different regions of your brain, whether it involves cars, food, beer, sleep, or whatever, right? That experience is volleyed around the brain, it's integrated, it's processed, 
and there isn't a response that is kicked out. You might be upset, you might be sad, you might be happy, you might be in love. But that is the whole idea, right? Is that you experience, you have an experience, that experience is processed across diverse brain regions, and then that's integrated, processed, and it's kicked out as some kind of behavioral response. Whether you're running, whether you're sad, you, you, guys, you guys are human beings, you guys understand all this. So that's how the brain generally works. And so, when you think about how this volume of experiences around the brain, you got to think about brain circuits. And brain circuits are what control behavior. And brain circuits are basically communication across brain regions. For example, if you see something, the information goes to the visual cortex. From the visual cortex, it gets kicked around different regions from the hippocampus to the cerebellum, to the thalamus, so on, to the amygdala, so on and so forth. So you have this cross communication from different brain regions where, which are interconnected by these brain circuits. And the idea is that brain circuits facilitate communication at the cellular level and at the macro level. So you have circuits that connect different regions like the hippocampus, the cortex, and so forth. And you have circuits within the hippocampus itself or within the cortex itself that communicate with each other, right? So the brain, brain function really is about cell-cell communication. That's all that it really is. It breaks down to neurons communicating with one another, and these circuits are comprised of neurons, glia, and synapses. Which begs the question, how is the brain like a football stadium? And I put Soldier Field on here because I know where I'm at. Um, although I'm not a Bears fan, I'm sorry. Um, this analogy works really well in Texas. As you can imagine. And so the way that I like to see the brain is that the players are the neurons, right? You're there at a football game to see the players. The players are the neurons. Everything else in that stadium is a glial cell, whether it's the field, the goalposts, the jumbotron, the suites, the, the concession stands, the guy wearing the Jake Cutler jersey. You get the idea, right? And if you don't have the football stadium, do you have a football game? No, you don't, right? If you don't have the players, you don't have the game. So the idea is that neurons and glia rely on one another. If the neurons don't have glia, the circuits don't function. If the neurons aren't there, we're not there, right? So it's this interrelationship that is fundamentally important for brain function, and it's important for understanding how brain tumors work, and hopefully in the future to treat brain tumors. So there's three main types of cells in the brain. There are neurons, which are here in red. There's astrocytes and there's oligodendrocytes. Astrocytes and oligodendrocytes comprise these glial cells that I was referring to. So neurons have these beautiful morphologies, the dendrites and axons, I'm sure you've heard about them. And this is where the cell-cell communication occurs, right? This is where neurons are talking about. Astrocytes, for lack of a better word, are the Swiss army knife of the brain. They basically do just about everything to support neuronal function. I could go into great detail since it's the only thing that I really know is astrocytes. But they do a lot of different really cool things that, that support brain function. And all of the dendrocytes, they, perform, they, 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 they are the basis of this myelin sheath that wraps, that wraps, wraps around axons and it's essential for neurons to communicate with one another through electrical activity. So they, they are basically the insulation that facilitates the uh, electrical conduction. So these are the three main cells. There's also a microglia, but we're not going to talk about that. We'll try and keep it doing something. So these are the three main subtypes in the brain. And this is sort of how they're, how they're integrated with one another. You have, in the yellow, you have a neuron with this long axon. The blue is the oligodendrocyte, which forms this really beautiful myelin sheath around the axon, which ensures that the neuron can fire natural potential and communicate with another neuron. Don't have the myelin sheath, the whole system falls apart because the, 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 the neuron cannot fire an astrocyte. And in the green, you have the most beautiful cell in the brain, the astrocyte, doing a lot of different things. Interact, and we'll talk about that. It interacts with the neurons, it interacts with the dendrocytes, it interacts with blood vessels, so there's a whole lot of things. So, this is sort of how, they're, how they look and how they're coordinating in the brain with the neuron being the player, firing, talking to other neurons, the astrocyte supporting whatever function they need, serving as sort of the water boys, providing you know, water and nutrients and things like that. And, and the oligodendrocyte there is sort of facilitating the actual firing of the neuron. So this is how it sort of looks and how their actions are coordinated in the functioning brain. So 
you may be asking yourself, what the hell does this have to do with brain tumors, right? And, for, and a lot of neuroscientists don't see this, right? Because they're all focused on the neurons. But in the modern age with modern genomics and so forth, we've been able to look very closely at brain tumors and what, what is the identity of cells that make a, a brain tumor. And here we're talking about grade four glioblastoma as, as an example of that. And we do all these modern genomic sequencing approaches. What we know is that the identity, right, the identity of these tumor cells looks a lot like glial cells. If you look here at the bottom, you see that there are four main subtypes of cells that exist within the glioma. One of them is an oligodendrocyte-like cell. Another one is an astrocyte-like cell. Those are glial cells. Another one is a neuroprogenitor-like, which, which can make oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And then you have sort of this immune population. And so what I want you to take home from this really complicated but also elegant study is that brain tumors adopt glial cell properties. Glial cells have functions in the brain. Brain tumors adopt these identities, and presumably they also have these functions. So glial cells can interact with neurons. So if glial cells can interact with neurons, can tumor cells also interact with neurons? And what does that mean in terms of brain tumor pathogenesis? and in terms of you know, neurological dysfunction and disorder when you have a, a brain tumor. So before we get into that, let's take one step back and think about what it, how, brain to, how neurons communicate. So as I mentioned, synapses are essential for brain circuit function. The synapse, basically, it sounds complicated, people will make it sound complicated, but all it basically is is a communication point between two neurons. This is, what, this is the key component of sort of brain function. This is where two neurons communicate. Neurons, a single neuron can make a thousand different synapses. So you can already see how computationally that's really difficult to track all that down, right? And brain function is reliant upon synapses. So this is sort of what we're gonna look at here in terms of tumors. And thinking about glial cells, glial cells are right there. Remember, these glial cells, brain tumors have these properties. Glial cells are right at the front. So on the left, you have the neuron astrocyte there's the green is a presynaptic part of a, of a synapse, the blue is a postsynaptic part of which your neurons communicating, and the yellow is an astrocyte. It's sitting right there at the synapse, providing, listening to the neuron, and providing whatever support it needs to efficiently conduct itself. On the right, we have a myelin sheet. This is the oligodendrocyte, this critical cell, that has basically formed this myelin sheet, this insulating structure that ensures that neurons can fire. So this is the nature of glial neuron interaction. All of the endocytes and astrocytes have these really intimate associations. Again, brain tumors have these properties. And just for some eye candy, I can, I can stare at this video all day. So in the green is an astrocyte, and in the red are the neurons. And I want to point out two things. Number one, that a single astrocyte can contact up to 100,000 synapses. And number two, Notice how intertwined the astrocyte is with the neuron. So you can see how, how, how intimate this relationship is. This astrocyte has hundreds of thousands of leaflets at, the, at its periphery that are, that are touching on a variety of synapses and influencing and facilitating circuit function, synaptic function, brain function. So the point here is that these astrocytes, which again, brain tumors adopt a lot of these properties, perhaps these functions could be important for brain tumor pathogenesis and for the treatments of brain tumors. Okay, I will, I will now stop this because I can watch it again. I can watch it again. Okay, it's a beautiful image. Okay, so this leads me to the second part of the talk, which is cancer neuroscience. And again, getting at, at this idea where how does brain function meet up with brain tumors? How do we bring these two concepts together, because these two fields traditionally do not talk with one another. The cancer biologists have traditionally viewed, and rightfully so, cancer as, a, as sort of a mutation gene-driven disease, which, which it is definitely. Neuroscientists think that cancer doesn't make any sense because it's too complicated to be mutations. This is from neuroscientists. And so I think what's happened over the last probably seven or eight years is that a lot of people that work in cancer and in neuroscience have started to communicate. And 
they started to understand, they started to realize that there is in fact an important bridge that needs to be made between these two fields. And I'm gonna talk about some of the really most important findings that have occurred over the last seven or eight years in the field of brain tumor cancer neuroscience. Okay, so just like glial cells can interact with tumors, I mean, I'm sorry, glial cells interact with neurons, tumor cells can interact with neurons in the brain. And there's three levels of interaction. One is electrochemical. This is wild stuff, where a neuron can make a direct synaptic connection with the brain tumor and cause it to fire. So there are direct electrochemical connections between tumors and neurons. The second level is this idea of paracrine signaling, where for lack of a better word, a neuron will spit, at, spit something at a tumor, the tumor will respond, and then the tumor will spit something back at the neuron to cause it to become hyperactive. So there's a sort of cross bi-directional signaling between the neuron releasing factors that promote tumor growth, and then the tumor releasing factors that feed back to the neuron and cause it to become more active. And the third level is really fascinating, this idea of systemic neural cancer interactions. It isn't necessarily, well, it's partially applicable to brain tumors, but the best example are in peripheral solid tumors, where, for example, if you manipulate the reward center, it can cause gut inflammation, it can promote colon cancer progression. Another good example of this is a lot of patients with breast cancer have trouble sleeping, in part because a lot of the cytokines that are released in the tumor go to the brain, and mess around with the TRN and a lot of things like this. So you can imagine it's not just local stuff in the brain, it's peripheral tumors feeding into sort of the entire body system and influencing brain activity. So this is really becoming quite an important aspect of cancer biology and also treatment of those with cancer. Okay. And so I'm gonna talk about the different levels of communication or different levels of interaction. So the first one is neuron to tumor communication. This is where a neuron is active, it will release a factor, or it, it will, again, it will, it will spit something, or release something, for lack of a better word. It will release something on the tumor. The tumor will uptake whatever is released by the neuron, and this will cause the tumor to grow. And the general idea here is that when neurons are more active, when neurons become hyperactive or more active, this, act, this neuronal activity, this synaptic, this synaptic activity, promotes tumor growth. So the neuron, the, the, the activity of neurons is important and required for the tumor to expand. What's also interesting, again, as I mentioned, is that brain tumors and neurons make direct synaptic connections. So you almost have this, this vampirization, right, by the tumor where it's basically feeding in and sucking off the resources from the neurons in order to grow itself. It's exactly what's happening here. And I'll show you some examples of this from model systems. So in my lab, we use the mouse model as our system, where we can make tumors in mice, and we can manipulate tumors, we can manipulate neurons, and we can look at how manipulating different neurons can influence tumor growth. So in, on the picture on, on, the, on the left, with the big blue brain, that's a mouse brain. The green is a brain tumor. The red is activated neurons. And what we've done in the saline sample, we basically, that's a control group see how the tumor is growing, but it's, it's not growing that massively. However, when we give the mice this drug that activates the neurons in the contralateral hemisphere, really far away from the primary tumor, the tumor grows. It's almost as if it's a moth to the flame. The tumor is moving towards this neuronal activity, right? It's, 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 it's attracted to it. It needs it to grow. That's exactly what, what this paper and what this figure is showing, that there's this reliance, right? It needs those factors from the neuron in order to grow and to, to expand. The other example on the right is a beautiful example of a synaptic connection between a tumor and a neuron. On the, on, in, the, in the blown up picture, you have the brown cell, which has a bunch of the vesicles, which are presynaptic vesicles. On the right, you have a tumor cell, which is receiving the synaptic input. So what the tumor cell is doing here, it is directly latching on to the neuron and is basically sucking out the nutrients in the, in the, in the neurotransmitters to facilitate its growth. And the take home message here is that neurons promote brain tumor progression. So actually neural activity is essential for this. The second form of communication is tumor to neuron communication, where tumors release things 
So in this example, this is actually an example from my lab where we found that a lot of, or an astrocyte will release factors that promote synapses. Tumors release the same factors that are that then are released by tumors. They travel to the synapse and they promote synapse formation and synapse function. And when these factors are released by tumors, what happens is the neurons become hyperactive. So the tumors release the factor, it's made more synapses, more connections, there's more activity. And when the tumors, or when the neurons are more hyperactive, what happens is that creates brain hyperactivity. And brain hyperactivity, another word for that is epilepsy. And if you know, 40 to 50% of brain tumor patients will present with some form of hyperactivity or seizure or a form of epilepsy. So one consequence of this, of this cross communication is brain tumor induced epilepsy. And we also showed that, that, that there are specific mutations that can make tumors that cause more hyperactivity or cause less hyperactivity. I'm trying to understand more about the genetics and mechanisms of that. So I'll show you a really cool video of, of this. So what we have here, before I start the video, if you're, what we have here is a mouse that has a brain tumor. And what you're gonna see is we put an optical sensor for neuronal activity into neurons in the brain. And what you're gonna see is all these lights flashing. These lights flashing are active, hyperactive neurons. And I want to point out that the brain tumor is in the lower right section. And I want you to notice how widespread this activity is. Just, it's not just local, it is throughout the brain. So I've pumped up this video enough. I hope that it meets expectations. This is a live mouse with a brain tumor. And you can see as it starts to light up, this, this again, this is neural activity starting to fire up. And you'll see that's not just in, in the lower right, it is throughout the brain. And you can see it's not just in one hemisphere, it's in both hemispheres. So this brain tumor is communicating with circuits throughout the brain. <laughs> and at the end here, you see a phenomenon called spreading depolarization, which neurologists still don't fully understand. In any event, you get the idea here that you have a tumor that's located in one region. It is causing aberrant neural firing throughout the brain. Clearly, there are there's cross communication going on, right, in both directions, right? The tumors, the neurons are promoting growth. The tumors themselves are rewiring neurons, making them hyperactive, and changing a lot of the, the, the basic circuits in the brain. And so the next form of communication I'll talk about is, is, is another form of tumor to neuron communication, where we talked about how tumors can release these factors that make synapses. Tumors can also release neurotransmitters themselves. So neurotransmitters are what drive synaptic activity. Right? This is essential for neurons to talk to each other and to communicate. Tumors release neurotransmitters directly onto neurons. This release of neurotransmitters can cause neurons to become hyperactive. It can cause a lot of changes in neuronal circuits because you know synapses are highly regulated. Any kind of deviation from that regulation can disrupt circuit function, can, has, can have huge neurological consequences. And you have a tumor in the brain just dumping neurotransmitters at any point, at any time, in an unregulated way. And so again, this causes neuronal hyperactivity. This hyperactivity can promote tumor expansion, getting back to this vicious cycle of cross communication. It's very Machiavellian of the tumor. The tumor sort of coaxes the neurons to become more active. When they become more active, they release more factors, which allows the tumor to expand. And here's an example of what this looks like. At the top, you see this is a mouse with a brain tumor where we basically imaged both the tumor and we used another fancy optical sensor that allows us to detect glutamate in the brain. And you can see with the tumor in the left hemisphere of the brain, you can see a sort of a progressive expansion of the tumor. And this is met with a progressive, a progressive expansion of glutamate. But notice how the glutamate is also in the contralateral hemisphere, in the hemisphere opposite of where the main tumor is. So again, this speaks to this widespread changes in synaptic activity, circuits in net and brain networks. And then on the right, you see a graph where we treated mice with a drug that blocks neurotransmitter release from tumors. 
So we treated a myasthenic this drug, and what it did is it actually stopped tumor-induced seizures. So this is a really important, this is a really important experiment for quality of life issues, right? It's important to sort of understand what are the neurotransmitter dynamics that are ongoing, and how can we blunt those so that we can have a better quality of life and possibly, you know, uh, impede tumor growth. And then the last form of communication is tumor-tumor communication. So these tumor cells talk to one another, right? They don't work, they don't work in isolation. And the idea here is that you have these things called microtubes, which are these highways that connect the tumor cells of one another. And it's these highways that allow for the flow of information across the tumor network. Just like there's a brain network, we talked about with synapses and so forth. The tumor itself has its own network, right? And these, these sort of, these microtubes serve as a highway that allows one cell to communicate with another cell to sort of pass information or nutrients or growth factors from one cell to another. And what's really interesting is that there, there are these hub cells called pacemaker cells. And that these cells control the flow of information across the entire tumor network. And that if you eliminate these pacemaker cells, actually can impede tumor growth, and I'll show some data on that as well. So this is another form of communication, it's tumor-tumor interactions. And again, so this is yet another mouse that has a, we torture mice, and I apologize. So this is, this is another mouse that has a brain tumor. And in this particular mouse, we put an optical another optical sensor for calcium, which is used as sort of um, a way of passaging information across the network. No. And you'll see that, you'll, you'll see from this video that these tumor cells are actively communicating with one another. So I'll leave it there. There it is. You can clearly see that there's a lot of activity going on, right? There's a flow of information. I think the health cell is the one that's really bright and that flashes periodically. Um, but you get the idea. There's a lot of communication going on just within this network. So you've got communication inside the, inside the tumor, within tumor cells, then these cells are communicating with neurons outside the tumor. So there's, there's a lot of complex cellular interplay going on just at the cell-cell communication level. And then I will add that the, figure, the, the, the graph on the right shows that if you treat these mice with this drug that, that inhibits this pacemaker cell that controls this whole network, you actually impede tumor growth. And this drug is actually used to treat forms of epilepsy. And I believe my, my, my good friend Frank Winkler in Germany is gonna start a trial with this one. So there's real hope here for this. So to sort of summarize this concept of cancer and neuroscience, I sort of have this integrated view of the whole idea. Now whether it's the activity that comes first or the tumor that comes first, we could debate that. But let's just go with the tumor that comes first, right? Cancer is still a genetic disease. Last time I checked. So what you have is, oh, oops, sorry. Got ahead of myself. So you have a tumor, and that tumor is releasing factors. It's dumping, it's spitting things onto the neuron. When it releases things, that causes neosynaptogenesis. It causes new synapses to be formed. These new synapses that are formed cause increased neuronal hyperactivity. The neurons become more hyperactive. When they become more hyperactive, the tumor of the neuron then releases factors like neuroligin-3, like glutamate, like BDNF. These, these factors that come from neurons interact with tumor cells and induce tumor cell proliferation. When the tumor cell proliferates, guess what it's gonna do? It's gonna then go back and release more synaptogenic factors and propagate. It's basically a self-propagating vicious cycle of cross-communication between the tumor and the neuronal microenvironment. And what we need to do is somehow interfere with this cross-communication. So how can we do that? And how can we do it in a way that is safe and it can be effectively combined with existing therapies to treat those with brain tumors? This is the holy grail, right? So the next part of this talk will be, um, un now that we, we know a little bit about the, this vicious cycle and the cross communication, can we use this information to create or to reuse or repurpose or reutilize 
existing tools that are used for neuropharmacology to combat brain tumors. Because you can imagine, it's a whole host of drugs that are used to combat epilepsy, to combat depression, to neuro, not neuro, a bunch of neuropsychiatric diseases, right? And these tumors express a lot of the channels and the receptors that these drugs target. So can we repurpose a lot of the existing neuropharmacology towards the treatment of brain tumors? And can we learn new, new concepts about brain tumors and develop new therapies? So this is where the field needs to go, and it is slowly getting there, but there is hope. So the idea is, can we short circuit tumor neuron interactions? And the idea would be to use neuroscience-based therapies as a way of blunting sort of neuron to tumor interactions or tumor to neuron interactions as a way of preventing the self-propagating vicious cycle from taking over in the brain. And in fact, there are a couple of trials. So there's a trial right now that, that, that works on ADD10, which blocks neuroligin-3, and that's actively ongoing right now. This is this neuroligin-3 thing is released by neurons, goes to tumors, and promotes their expansion. And there's also existing a drug, parampanol and metamine, which are used to block glutamate receptors on neurons. So remember, the glut glutamate serves as a way of activating neurons. If you can block the receptor that glutamate uses, you can potentially dampen neuronal activity, which could have a positive effect on tumor, which could impede tumor growth. These are clinical trials that are ongoing right now as well. And so, in fact, there's a whole list of neuroscience-based clinical trials that are ongoing, but I will have most of you know that these are actually for solid tumors outside of the central nervous system. And ironically, some of the first observations that linked neurons to tumors were not made in the brain. That's why, right? I mean, to me, that just blows my mind. Why would you look in the brain first, right? But in fact, some of the first observations were made were you cut the, you cut the nerve next to a prostate tumor and it doesn't grow. If you get rid of the nerves in the breast tumor, it doesn't grow. Same thing with gastric cancer. So a lot of these early, early operations were made in non-brain tumor systems, non-CNS tumors. And so accordingly, a lot of the trials now are being used, are, are actually for non-CNS sort of peripheral tumor, tumor nerve interaction. So there's hope from other tumors, and we're working, we're, we're getting there for brain tumors. But nevertheless, people are beginning to really think about brain tumor therapy through the lens of neuroscience and a lot of the existing neuropharmacology that is already in play, gets with blood brain barrier, is already safe. That's a really good starting point for this. So what's next and where do we need to go? So as I mentioned earlier, um, discovery and basic science is sorely needed. And, that's, and, the, a, and the ABT has done a tremendous job over their 50 years in existence of supporting discovery-based and basic science. This is, this, is, this is really the foundation of how much all therapy is going on. The other thing, that, as I mentioned, was we need to use existing neuropharmacology as a means of intervention. These drugs exist. We need to understand how to use them. And I think really importantly is that cancer biologists and neuroscientists really need to have more conversations. And I hate to say this, whenever I go talk to neuroscience colleagues, I get blank looks on their face. Because they're thinking about electrical signaling and circuits and don't really understand the concept of tumor interfering with their beautiful circuits. And I think we really need to have much more conversations. That's what I'm trying to do with the other college of medicine, is build the Center for Cancer Neuroscience where we're cancer biologists focus on brain tumors that interact with neuroscientists and bring all of these, all of these disciplines together. And finally, in the future, I, we, we really need to leverage genomics. That's fundamentally important. In, in the field, in the last two decades, there's been an explosion of sequencing technology where we, where we basically have reached saturation mutagenesis where we've sequenced every single tumor. We know nearly every single mutation in all forms of cancer. And there's over three million different mutations associated with all forms of cancer. But we only know what 5,000 of those mutations do. That's crazy, right? So we've cataloged them. We know what they are. We don't know what they do. And I think the next phase of this is sort of bringing functional genomics into this, right? Because every tumor is different, just like every brain is unique, right? We need to get to that point at some point in time.
fun. So that's what's next. Um, disclaimer, uh, thank you. You guys were great. <laughs> um, and finally, I want to thank, uh, I'll give you guys a brief summary. So again, sort of, the, the, if you take home anything from this talk, three points. Number one, brain function is a central component of brain for biology. It's essential. It happens in the brain, the brain's unique, the brain's run by neurons, these interactions are essential. Number two, cancer neuroscience is an emerging field, right? It's young, it's still, and we're still trying to figure out what it means. We have this big powwow in Germany in July, and we're, we're getting there, right? I think this, this is where the field needs to go. We need to innovate in there. And the third thing is, lessons from neuroscience can and will treat brain tumors in the future. We're getting there, we're going to get there. And finally, I would like to thank my lab. I have a great lab, and I don't even want to tell you how awesome they are. And I'll take questions. All right, great session, great talk, Dr. Denis. And we will take questions. Please submit them uh, on the Hoopa app or raise your hand, and we'll bring a mic over to you. I see a question right here. Thanks, Rob. Okay, I have a question. Yes. I know you can't tell me how this tumor got in my husband's brain, but I would like to know how you got the tumor in the mouse's brain. <laughs> so, so there are a couple, there's two main ways that this works. One is you can take a human tumor, you can culture a human tumor, and you can just transplant it into the mouse brain. But that's not how tumors grow in humans. I don't go to someone and stick a tumor in them, okay, let's get rid of it, right? But it's still, a, it's a good way of studying human tumors. That's one way of studying them. Another way is this crazy technique that we developed in the lab called in utero electroporation. And what we do is we take a pregnant mouse and we inject the embryonic cortical, the embryonic cortex with DNA containing genes that promote tumors or knock out tumors. So we can basically manipulate the embryonic brain with mutations that cause cancer. We can stuff the pups back into the mom. They're born a couple of days later, and 80% of these mice will generate tumors. And th this is how tumors normally form. Well, you don't know you don't the mutations, right? But, but it, 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 they form from native cells. So one system is you transplant the cell to human, which is great if you study human cells, and you complement that with using native models where you can look at how tumors grow from, from endogenous cells in the brain. So those, those are the two ways that we did this. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. I read somewhere about um, gabapentin can under some circumstances retard tumor growth. Do you have any background or know anything about that research? I know a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yes, so the, the preliminary data on that is really, really interesting, right? It's really promising, um, but as I mentioned, every tumor is different, every brain is different. So, yeah, gabapentin is something that can be used, it's, it's tolerated, it's not, gonna, it's not going to kill you, right, if you take it. So, yes, it's something that could be, that, that what you're describing is exactly what I was mentioning, repurposing the existing drugs to, to treat brain tumors with the caveat that we need to know more about how your brain is different and how maybe your tumor matches that. Precision oncology. Because what was probably happening is some patients will respond, some will not respond, and we need to understand why that is. And it's probably tied into the genomics and whatever channels and receptors they express that respond to those drugs or don't respond to those drugs. But yes, that is something that could be used potentially cautiously. I was going to say one of the things too is yay to your team, okay? <laughs> and um, if I'm pretty correct, though I'm not positive, they've had experimental things that they've shown in the other room for this particular occasion uh, that we had a couple, you know, over the last couple of days. And, you know, if this was one of those things that you were doing that might have been part of the exhibit that had been done earlier. I really appreciate the work that you're doing now to see and learn how um, the brain tumors are developing. So thank you for doing the work. Thank you. 
All right, I think we'll take just one last question. That's all the time that we'll have. But. Um, hi, my name is Jenny, and I'm a longtime volunteer for ACA. Right, right here. Where? Ah, there you go. I'm looking over here. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. I'm coming up on 15 years with an oligo dendroblioma, and um, I, like, at the beginning of my diagnosis, I always thought that BBMs always came from astrocytes. Um, can they also be derived from other than dendrocytes? GBM, you're referring to? Yeah, the glioblastic. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, there is mounting evidence that the cell of origin, in fact, of GBM comes from an oligo dendrocyte precursor. However, the basic sciences to me tells me that you can never really know the cell of origin in a human tumor. But there is evidence that, that from, from our mouse models and other experimental models and informatics, that it is possible slash likely that cell of origin of a GBM could likely be an oligodendrocyte precursor, for sure. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm going to take just one last question. I'm so sorry about yes. that. Go ahead and ask me. Hi, so I've kind of asked this question to others, so sorry it's repetitive, but I'm a little over five years glioblastoma survivor, and I take some repurposed drugs, which I've took almost since the beginning. Um, that formin about in five of year, and then a newer one is I was taking Lexapro after my diagnosis, and I read some articles about Prozac being helpful for uh -huh. GBM. So I, my doctor switched me as my request from Lexapro to Prozac, so I'm curious your opinions on that. Oh, I got opinions on that. Um, <laughs> so I probably should. This, I'm gonna say something a little bit out of pocket right now. It's not published, but my lab is messing around. I guess that's the right word, messing around. <laughs> that's what I'm paying to do. <laughs> um, so we have we have evidence that a lot of the serotonin receptors that respond to SSRIs are expressed on various not GBM, but other forms of pediatric cancer. And we have, we're working on this right now. We just started the SSRI experiments with this, with the, it's called a penomoma, it's a type of tumor. And we think that penomomas could be, again, this is unpublished, right, don't, um, they could be responsive to this. And it's exactly what I was sort of referring to, is that you have to understand that what receptors are the channel for there, and sort of wire that up, match that combinatorial code with what, with what drugs might work on that. And SSRIs are certainly something that I think could be used because they block channels. I just, my paper, my lab published paper in Science a couple months ago where we showed that serotonin itself travels from outside the cell into the nucleus and rewires the entire epigenome. So you have, so you can have a neurotransmitter that's going into the nucleus and changing gene expression. So there's absolutely a real reason for looking at SSRIs and these types of drugs. So I think that's, yes, but again, it depends upon what you're tuned to, you know, what's expressed and whether it responds or not. Because it may not respond or it may respond, depending upon what channels and so forth you have are expressed on the surface of the channel. Thank you so much, Dr. Neen, and thank you all for your wonderful questions.